in Romans, our Roman study, and and uh, I want to, uh, you know, we made it through verses one through four of chapter fourteen last Sunday, and it was my intention to go through to verse thirteen this morning until I started going back over all of my study this morning, and it just seemed like I was adding into those first verses again as uh, the Lord just really began to speak to my heart regarding some things. And so I'm not sure I'm going to make 13 verses. I'm not saying I won't, but, um, you know, I may just, uh, I may end up only going to verse 8. But anyway, we'll see where that goes. But will you stand with me? I'm going to read from verse uh, 4 through 13. Who are you to judge another's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observe it, observes it to the Lord, and he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat and gives God thanks. For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. But why do you judge your brother, or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. Lord, again, thank you for your counsel that directs us as a family. We thank you that you're the head of our family. We thank you that you lead the way. We thank you for the love that you have given to us and the ultimate sacrifice that has saved us. And so, Lord, we just pray that you continue to be glorified in our lives. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. You can all be seated. So the title of the message is, Do Not Antagonize. Do Not Antagonize. And so you know how we can do. We can get under each other's skins as siblings. We can annoy each other. I mean, it happens. And we can get to the point where we are then unfriendly to one another. A brother who's offended. It's easier to win a walled city than a brother that's offended, the Proverbs tell us. I mean, I, can, I for one, shake my head. I've seen that happen. And I just go, really? How can... How can you not forgive and how can you not extend grace regarding misunderstanding when God has been so gracious to you and to me? How dare you hold a grudge? Does God hold a grudge against you? <laughs> and we're to follow his example. If you remember last week's title was No Condescending Allowed. And so that, this whole section that we're dealing is dealing with the Christian faith and doubtful things. And it's not to be looking down at one another because really, what's up with that? Do we want to strip ourselves of the blessings of God in our midst? Because it's in unity that God commands the blessing. What right do we have to turn our nose up at one another when we're you know the the lord's prized possession he died to save us we're his treasure 
we have you know the nerve to think otherwise and so if you are stronger in the faith and enjoy a greater degree of liberty how is that where does that come from isn't it from god himself i mean really a, a christian who's a snob doesn't have a leg to stand upon and even as we you know look in the scriptures we're reminded because in first corinthians chapter four paul puts it well when he says for who makes you differ from another and what do you have that you did not receive now if you did indeed receive it why do you boast as if you had not received it in doing so you'd be like somehow or another in my own all my great learning and experience because i was able to embrace grace in such a way that now i'm better than you and somehow be the type of person that takes credit for it oh my goodness how sad so rather we are to have a welcoming attitude and you know we has seen that there even in uh verse one of last week's text receive one who is weak that's a that's a welcoming attitude remember i did mention this is not a a section that is dealing with sin but even when we're dealing with sin there's an attitude that we're to have toward one another let alone in this situation but we see in first peter 4 verse 8 peter writes and above all things have fervent love for one another for love will cover a multitude of sins as well as when bad attitudes turn into sin or pompous attitudes turn into sin we too need to extend that and say hey what's up with this you know where's humility and be an example of it but don't strike back but love is never condemning and a a brother who judges is really not following the lead of the holy spirit because sure love is honest love speaks the truth for sure but not in a condemning judgmental way but one who cares because love is con love is concerned with building and rescuing you know not destroying never as love comes from the direction of kicking somebody to the curb to hurt them you know to be one up on them rather love is 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 the idea of of really bearing one another's burdens so fulfilling that law of christ which is love so we are to be welcoming one another not judging this is necessary for a good foundation in fellowship because when you have that going on the fellowship is then built up and then we have a healthy church who doesn't want that and once you have a healthy church guess what it's my experience god sends more to minister to because you don't want a healthy church just to <laughs> you know to be able to enjoy it and to be kind of you know closed off but rather a healthy church would be a church that would minister to more that god could send and send more to be ministered to and so and so in verse four of the text there it really shows us that we're on equal ground we're all servants and who are you to judge another servant if we're on equal ground who are you to judge because you're a servant as well and if there if there was a pecking order if one really did exist the pecking order would be all of us and god as sad, as sad as it is how people develop their little pecking order i'm in a better place 
than you. I'm better than you. I've got a better connection than you, and so forth. It's not right. And so the Bible tells us, and I love this verse, and is the promises of God true or not? And he says, and has God changed? Is the Old Testament God the, the New Testament God? Absolutely. And he reveals himself in ways that are consistent in both. But the word in 2 Chronicles 16.9 tells us that for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. And then he says, in this you have done foolishly, therefore from now on you shall have wars, he says to Asa, the king. But the principle is, is that God searches for that man whose heart is loyal to him so that he might show himself strong on his behalf. Who doesn't want that? To have the strong arm of the Lord holding you up and directing your life. And so none of us have the right to dictate what that will be in one another's life. The only privilege we have really is to recognize it and to be helpful not harmful, to build up, not to tear down. That's the Jesus style. And even when we must say the hard things, it will not be over doctrinal doubtful things, rather only on those things that God has made perfectly clear. Because let's face it, there's things that are in the category of sin that is not questionable or doubtful. But then there's a whole gamut of things that are in the doubtful category that Christians make almost at like it's a law of God to believe my way. You know, you take the, 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 the subject of smoking. That smoking can kill you. Nobody's going to argue that. Smoking's a bad habit. N nobody's going to argue that. And it stinks. Nobody's going to argue that. The, you know. <laughs> but you can't say that, you know, smoking defiles the temple of the living God. Really. So are you saying that by puffing a cigarette, I'm defiling the very work of God that's pure in my heart and my life? Or is there any difference between going down to L.A. and growing up breathing the smog? Are you saying that dirty air can defile the temple of God? I've heard Christians say this. Are you serious? Yes. It's a sin and you must repent. You're carnal. Well, you know, I don't agree with that. I used to love to smoke. I just didn't want to stumble my brother anymore because of where God was calling me to. But I have no problem standing downwind of somebody smoking. I love the smell of it. And there's other people who go, oh, wow, good gee, that's so horrible. Really? Are you so self-righteous that you're going to condemn somebody for smoking? As if they're not the servant of the Lord? What right do you have to do that? You have no right to do that. Because you can't go to the word of God and defend that. It's not immorality. You know. And so that's where the self-righteous, and I can go on with this. I really can. You know, I have, you know, see, this is why I knew this was going to happen. So I had pet, <laughs> I have pet, pet peeves, is that how I say it? About things, okay? For instance, you know, some people, you know, will go to, let's play, go to Las Vegas and drop a quarter in a slot machine. And in passing. And there'll be other Christians say, they'll be condemning that person for being a gambler. You know. Really, where are you going to go to the Bible to defend that? Sure, it's a bad habit. Matter of fact, 
It's difficult for me because my dad was a gambler, big time gambler, just stripped the family of financial stability. Couldn't stay away from the tracks, the track, horse track. He was a gambler. So, yeah, so, you know, I mean, the thoughts of it, I remember so much in my upbringing that hurt, you know, because of it. And I, but you know what? There's people who say, I love watching those horse races. I go down there, I have $30 set aside for my entertainment for the day. I'll put $2 on each race. There's nine of them. That's $18, and I have $12 to eat. And then at the end, it's the end. You gambler. <laughs> You're disgusting. But yet, they'll go down to the movie house, and they'll drop 30 bucks in a heartbeat, watching something that that other Christian would say, I can never watch that. So then you get the Christians go, I don't dance, I don't chew, and I don't hang with those that do. Because you see, I'm special. That's what we're talking about here. How dare we? How dare we? And other people say, oh, I like a cold drink. I, I, I crack a beer after work because when I get home, I just need to have that. I just love it. I don't drink at all. I don't touch it. Why? Because God showed me personally that he was calling me a place where I wasn't ever going to drink. 1981, I had my last beer because the Lord showed me. But I don't point my finger at other people. I, I, I run into people sometime. You know, they got six-pack in their cart at the market. And first they try and go another way. <laughs> you know? <laughs> no names. And then, uh, you know, and sometimes I just let them go. But sometimes it's just, I can't help it, you know. <laughs> but you know what? I don't really, but, but, but the, for whatever reason, I end up in the same line as them without paying attention, standing right behind them. And then they're just like so nervous. Well, you know, it's sad. Yeah, if they, they're going to, I mean, yeah, maybe, maybe they have something to be nervous about. Maybe they, you know, go into the car and crack every one of those six beers open and guzzle them before they go home or something, you know, well, then that's a problem. But you see where we can go with this judging stuff? Well, that's displeasing to the Lord. That's not the Jesus style. I mean, he, he, even a woman caught in the very act of adultery, and he writes in the sand whatever it is he wrote, but the accusers all went away. Jesus says, Where's your accusers? There's, there are none, Lord. Well, I don't accuse you either. Go your way and sin no more. I mean, what? That's grace. Go sin no more. You've got the rest of your life to just serve God. Why be condemning? Oh, my goodness. So, the Lord shows himself strong on our behalf. But you know what? There's going to be false teachers. They're going to be the false teachers that come and they try to endorse this legalistic doctrine so that you no longer understand true grace, that you get it messed up in your head and your heart somehow, that you're a notch above somebody else. Your church has it better. You know, you're better. Well... You don't think the Holy Spirit knows your heart? He knows your heart. The Apostle Paul, you know, uh, as he continues, when he, gets, when he gets to chapter 16 of Romans, and he says this, listen to this. He says, now, I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned, and avoid them. For those who are such, do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech, deceive the hearts of the simple. So these guys are going to have the right words, holy words. And they're going to have these, this uh, flattering speech. They're going to impress with their words. 
but they're going to deceive. And they're all about self-serving themselves. There's going to be false teachers. Peter, he tells, that, he tells us also in, in 2 Peter 2.1, where he says, uh, do I have to look it up? I guess I do. So, <laughs> I, I guess I do here, yeah. And so, you know, in 2 sec, in uh, Peter 2.1, where he says, but there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. And so there's going to be false teachers. They are going to have persuasive words. They are going to have good words, fancy speeches, and the very simple are going to be undermined and deceived. And so we need to be back to the base, basics. There's some that by now should be teachers, but they still need to be taught, Hebrews 5 tells us. And so, you know, it's, uh, it's not about academia. But what it is about is teaching on grace and truth. It's not about intellectualism, but it's about understanding the heart of God and being led by the Holy Spirit. That's the difference. And when man's impressed with intellectualism, and there's, it's a dangerous place to be. There's nothing wrong with appreciate, appreciating somebody like a Chuck Missler, who's now home with the Lord. But seriously, most of what he would always talk above my head and, and if I really wanted to understand what he'd say, I had to listen to his messages two and three times. I have to dissect when he'd just pass over scriptures. He'd just throw them out there. I couldn't keep up. But for the most part, and for most of us, I love what J. Vernon McGee, he said, get off your high horses. You're not feeding giraffes. You're feeding sheep. Put the cookies on the bottom shelf where the kids can get to them. That's me. And that's how I was always ministered to by the Holy Spirit. Always, from day one. I have not outgrown that. And so I pass on what the Lord gives me. And then, you know, when you look in, in our text at, at verse 6 there, you know, we see that, that's God, God's point of view. You know, it's not my place really to convince you of your conscience. You see, this is the godly perspective when you look at that verse 6. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord, and he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat and gives God, God thanks. And so, you know, we're to, we're to have the same heart towards the Lord every day. That's correct. One day shouldn't be held above another to hold that day, you know, in a place that puts God in a special place in our day and in our life. You know, if we choose to eat or not to eat, we should honor God in our choices. And we are to be thankful either way. If we have freedom to eat or not, or observe one day over another. We do not make the rules. And really, what business is it, is it of yours or mine to do that? It's not. You know, that's up to the Lord. And so, this is my main thought, you know, to the message title, Do Not Antagonize. Do not bring a dissenting attitude into our church. Because and then all of a sudden the drama continues and it follows because of man-made rules. Oftentimes with dress codes as well. Where it just gets too crazy. And so putting rules upon people that God never 
intended. And, and then to try and direct a, people, a person's life when God's never pressured them in certain areas. Because we are not the Holy Spirit. We are not. I remember a pastor sharing that has a church in Las Vegas, a Calvary Chapel there. And he it was a Calvary Chapel pastor's conference and he was sharing about the kinds of people. It'd be like having church in Hollywood, I guess. The kinds of people that walked in. These were, you know, barmaids uh, and... Guy, people that worked in casinos and walked along the strip, everything imaginable, and the Holy Spirit would bring them through the doors of that church to get saved, and they'd have to hurry off to work. They had no such convictions yet. They weren't all of a sudden mature believers knowing what to do. They'd head off to work, and then they couldn't come back. They couldn't wait to come back to church the next week. Then they'd learn a little bit more, but they still looked the same. And, and the pastor would say, it was hard. But there was a heart of the people that understood. The Holy Spirit had to change that individual's lifestyle, and it didn't happen overnight. So if you had a church that was condemning, God never had the opportunity to speak into their lives because somebody run them out the back door. Really? How much time did you need? I needed years, years. It wasn't as obvious maybe as some of what went on there, but I needed years to have my life changed. And so if anything, I understand that point of grace. And I think as a church body, we need to too, because we're in the end times. So what if God begins to send people here that uh, we feel a little uncomfortable around? How are you going to treat them? Yeah, we're going to speak the truth in love. But will there be love? You know? Because if there's not love, then there's not God. And, and, so, and so it's important because if we begin to put rules that God's never put on us, then it causes a stress and a divide in the fellowship. So, there can be stresses upon our spiritual man that is not sin. Rather, pressures that weigh us down, like what Hebrews 12, 1 tells us. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And so we're to lay aside every weight and the sin. Because there are things that can weigh us down just because of conscience sake. Conscience sake. And to tell you the truth, some of that weight can be put on by brothers and sisters who have no right to have done that. And then it begins to cause stresses you don't know how many people have left the church, not just this one, but this one as well, because a brother and a sister had the nerve of putting condemnation upon them. It's sad. It can stem from that. And I remember uh, as, a, as a very young Christian, it was in the late 70s, probably around 79, I would say. But I was at a, a men's meeting at a church in Southern California, Calvary uh, Chapel in um, Downey. And there was the assistant pastor there, and he was conducting the men's meeting. And then there was a guy who was kind of talking about going to Las Vegas and gambling that you know that's where he had come from that weekend and then the the pastor just said well we're not supposed to gamble right i mean that's not a good thing to gamble right now i happen to be standing right there i knew the assistant pastor but i didn't know the guy he was talking to and 
And then he went on just to minister. So he gave that light, gentle word, and then the Holy Spirit could put a hammer behind it. The Holy Spirit chooses to. But how terrible it would be for him to be condemning to this man who maybe never even thought about it. You don't know where somebody's coming from. What right do you all of a sudden have to be God? You don't have no right. You don't have enough information to judge. And I would not be want to be guilty for condemning somebody. Not me. I forget it. I mean, if I can be used by the Holy Spirit, you know, even as I pastor, I'm very careful, and I'm sure I've blown it before, but I'm very careful what I say when I'm up here because I don't want to misrepresent the Lord. And so, and so I do pray that I don't do that. And, you know, of course, my, my pastor, uh, he had something to say on this that, that I'd like to, uh, to read. He says this, he says, and it's regarding what, you know, he who observes one day above another, but he says, people have always argued over which day should be observed as a day of worship. In the early church, Christians began to worship on Sunday as that was the day uh, on which Jesus had risen from the dead. And this pattern was continued throughout history and was, dis and was discussed by Justin Martyr and Tertullian and other church fathers. But some of the Jews in the early church were pushing for Saturday worship according to the Jewish tradition. There are still those days, including the seventh day uh, I'm sorry, there's still those today, including the Seventh-day Adventists, who advocate Saturday worship. Paul pointed, pointed out here that some people esteem one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. It is acceptable to have these differences of opinion and these differences of practice. What isn't acceptable is to judge each other based on these convictions. Paul in Colossians 2.16 says, To not let anyone judge you according to the Sabbath days. I'm personally, I'm personally the kind of person who esteems every day alike. To me, every day is the Lord's day. I wake up every morning, dedicate the day to the Lord. It is relevant uh, to me what day it is, as they are all the Lord's day. But I, want, I won't judge you if you see it differently. And I hope you won't judge me. These are the kinds of issues that the body of Christ should be, should, should be div dividing over these are the kind of issues that the body of Christ should be dividing over and arguing about. Should be, should not be dividing over and arguing about, unquote. And so, my pastor, pastor of grace, and he always shared that. But the Jews, they had that tradition and oftentimes, traditions is what would cause people to make the law that would govern somebody else. And it was never intended by God. They would have, you know, uh, no work being able to be done on the Sabbath day. There was, uh, you know, certain laws forbidding certain kinds of things or even restricting travel. And there was also um, additional offering that was taken on the Sabbath day. They had all these things going on when I was in Israel. I remember witnessing for myself. They had the, um, what do you call it, the um, elevators in this hotel, uh, hotel, the King Solomon Hotel where we were staying. And they had one designated for the, G the Jewish people that were celebrating the Sabbath. So on, on that uh, Saturday, there was one elevator designated to stop at every floor so they didn't have to push the button. I, wit I witnessed to myself. Now, obviously, I got on the other one because I was going up to the ninth floor. I wasn't going to ride that one, you know. You know, and that's what the law does. That's what those rules do. You know, it's like Elf, you know, where he gets on that elevator and he pushes all 100. And that guy just looks at him. Stops at every one. He's going up to like 80th floor or something. <laughs> that's taken to an extreme. But see, that's what the law does. It puts unnecessary pressures on people. And it's not a good thing. But we all serve under grace. It's never commanded for us to keep the Sabbath. 
For us, all days are equally sacred. But there is a footnote I'd like to throw in there. There is the principle of resting one in seven. That's just wisdom. Because there is a day that the way we're set up in our social, in our system, for the most part, what? We are able to worship together on a Sunday, which is really great. And, and so resting one in seven is important because it's also saying, God, I'm dedicating this day to you. Not, as a, not legal, legalistically, but because it's my privilege. And that's the difference. But Christians can be doctors and they can be first responders, you know, policemen, firemen. They could be soldiers, people who work on Sundays. Good thing. How hypocritical it is to be the Christian that says that nobody should do any of that stuff on Sunday. You hypocrite. But if your child was suddenly in an accident, wouldn't you be the first one to call help? Or would you, with the hardness and coldness of your legalistic view, not make a phone call because it's labor? Would you be one condoning the man who or condemning the man who's working that day that comes and saves your child? You see how far it goes? It's a sad thing when people do that. And it's a horrible thing. But we follow the example in Scripture of Sunday worship, the first church corporately worshiping. You know, Jesus raised on that Sunday morning The next two consecutive Sundays he spent with his disciples. The Holy Spirit was given on Sunday at Pentecost, that first day. The disciples broke bread that first day. Paul in in Corinth instructed a special offering on that first day, Sunday. And so there's a lot of practical purposes for that. But what's important is that we're free to serve the Lord either way. And I did want to at least get, oh my. (laughs) Yeah, I don't think I can do that. But for verse 7, for none of us lives to himself and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. And so... No one's an island to himself. We're to live our whole life dedicated to the Lord, the Apostle Paul. And you know, oh my goodness. So I can't go that way because I have too much to share. And this, this is this morning when the Lord really began to put on my heart this verse 8. And I'm just going to say that You know, there's a strategy in the world and and that is to rip us off. To rip us off of just living for the Lord. To rip us off on the fact that this life is temporary. I love what the Apostle Paul, he writes, and we talked about this on Wednesday night, when he said in Acts 20, he's talking to the Ephesian elders, and he says, but none of these things move me nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of grace of God. Nothing moved him. Even his whole life, you know, being over with because he was given in service to the Lord. He says in Philippians, this one always blows my mind, in chapter 1, when he's speaking about to live as Christ, he says, for, he says, I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the sup- supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectations and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death, for to me to live as Christ and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet 
What I shall choose I cannot tell, for I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And because confident of this, and being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. The Apostle Paul was set free from the idea of dying. Can you imagine? Completely set free from this idea of this body that we now inhabit perishing. The idea of this body that we have getting weaker and weaker and older and older and more disabled. He was completely set free from that. That whole business, like Johnny Erickson Tata, who had to work through being paralyzed just out of high school and then serving the Lord with full verver as a quadriplegic and making a difference in people's lives because her spirit at first was not set free, but afterwards she was set free. And next Sunday, I want to spend a little bit more time on this because this is important. Because it's very easy to become sidetracked and swallow the philosophy of the world that tells us just completely different than that. But you know what? They have no answer to fill the void of which that leaves a person in. The hollowness of life. How many have been hearing about suicides lately? That's just the ones of well-known people. Suicides are happening every day, and and age has no, makes no difference because of the emptiness that people are experiencing. But yet, we are to be filled up with Jesus Christ because the curse speaks of death but Christ speaks of life. So when you're filled up with Christ, you're high on life. But if you're still suffering the repercussions of the curse, you're empty. And then death can take its toll. Amen? Let's uh, stand together. Well, I do have a head start on next week's message, so just to let you know. (laughs) Let's pray. So, Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for your commitment to us for life. We thank you that we can trust you and your faithfulness. Lord, we do want to be in that place where we can count it all joy when we endure fiery trials, that we would be in that place where we wouldn't think of them as something strange, as something strange has come upon us, but we would understand that your perfect will is being accomplished in our lives, Lord, and we would be those who would understand that so that peace would remain in our hearts, that peace that passes understanding. So I pray for all those this morning and I ask God that we would bring glory to you and that we would be a benefit and a blessing to one another, not a hindrance, not a a burden. So I pray for all those that are here, Lord, and I just ask that they be set free in their ability to worship you and their hearts would be healed from the ill effects of what man might bring down upon them in society but that they would have their eyes fixed upon you, Lord, and that you would be that guiding light and counsel in their lives. And so we thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.